Stone Drive off Pop Level Road and uh, goes underneath Liberty High School. Is, is there running water generally in the ditch line? It has a constant flow of water. Sometimes it's just much more to get your feet wet, not a heavy flow. Is it? Does it sometimes look like a creek? Yes, it does. Are there several ditch lines running through this neighborhood? There is two ditch lines that run through our neighborhood. Okay, so is this one right there? Yes, ma'am. And then is the other over here? Yes, ma'am. And I'm going to walk up and hand you the, this laser uh, so that you can identify various locations around the neighborhood. Um, that's the bottom button, and you're just pointing at the screen. Can you show the jury uh, where your house would be if this happened? But if you follow this ditch line and go straight across, this street right here would be Helk Avenue. One more street up into this area would be Gilmore Lane, and my house is right beside this ditch. I have no neighbor. I have a ditch. So it's I would be located somewhere right about there. So is Trey allowed to walk between your house and his mother's house? Yes, ma'am. Can you identify any of the houses of various friends of his that were in this neighborhood? Yes, I could. Right about in here is Donovan Hudson's house. This large home right here is actually Walter Hudson's original home, and I think at that time that's where Donovan was living into an apartment on this side, and they moved across the street. And then you have the Joey Ballard, which lives right about in this vicinity right here, and then Joshua Cole, he this was his actually his grandparents' home, and they lived right about in here. And were those Trey's good friends? Yes, yes, ma'am. Do you know where Cassie Galker's house was? Cassie Galker's house would have been right there. Okay, and I'm going to switch at this point. This line is right here. Where's Cassie's house? Cassie's got house is right here. And, and it's the one you circled Amanda's house? Yes, ma'am. Is there a, uh, a fence between Cassie's house and the ditch line? No, I, not between her house and the ditch line. It's free open. Okay. And if you know, is there one between Amanda's house? The next door neighbor, which is Christopher Bryant's home, he has a fenced in yard, so yes. All right. Um, Judge, may I set up the easel? Yes, you may. Actually, have a new pad of paper back in the back, but okay. I know there are a lot of participants in this story, and I want to just outline the connections between some of them. For the so I will start with Trey. She has a daughter named Mackenzie. And who is Mackenzie's father? Mackenzie's father is Travis Savage. When did you and Amanda meet? Me and Amanda, I guess we really had knowledge of her, of each other for our whole lives. She, her dad lived right behind my grandmother's. I seen them play as kids. But however, we didn't personally meet until probably latter part of 94 through 95, I would say. Um, Did you all start dating? 
we started dating in 95, uh, I would say first part of it, from what I can remember. Yes, Trey would Trey would have been conceived somewhere around December or January of two or 1996. Uh, he was born September the third, 96. Did you and Amanda ever marry? No, we did not. When did you break up? Yeah, we were always off and on, but we started. The only documentation that I have to. From what I remember from that those, those days was in '98 we started a custody battle. Uh, we stayed together off and on through '96, '97, and it got pretty rough there in '98. How old were you when Trey was born? I was 19 years old. 19. How old was Amanda? She would have been 16. After you and Amanda split started your custody battle. Who did Amanda end up getting together with? Amanda got up, got got married to Joshua Gowker. And did Gowker have a child at that time? Yes, he did. Who was his child? Joshua Young. And who do you know who Josh Young's mother was? Yes. Her name was Angie. Angie. Angelina. Did all of you all live in the same neighborhood, basically? Yes, we did. Um, when did you meet Josh Gowker? It was probably back in middle school, sixth, sixth or seventh grade, when I had knowledge of Joshua moving from Michigan. And that's, that's about the best I could do with that. I don't, I mean... Did he live in that same neighborhood? Yes, he did. He lived right across the street from my grandmother. And did you associate with him when he first moved back? Yes, ma'am, we did. Okay. Um, and what was your relationship like as you grew up? It started out fine, and uh, then we realized, or I realized, that he uh, was a thief and uh, got uh, stole my cell phone, stole bicycles, uh, whatever he could get his hands on. And at that time, we had no longer any cordial uh, contact with each other. If it was any contact at all from that point on, it was a fight. Um, are you, if you were aware, did Amanda um, date or run around with Gallagher prior to her relationship with you? Yes, ma'am. I had knowledge of her seeing Josh. She never claimed it to be any, any importance, but I had knowledge of her being with Josh. Yes, ma'am. And, and was he actually gone um, at the time that you all got together? Yes, he was. Um, was he a part of the reason that you all had a custody battle? Yeah, no. I mean, Amanda seen several other guys after me, and it got to the point where these other guys were telling me that I could not see my child. So I pushed child support on myself and took myself to court for it. And then when Gowker come about, Gowker had always been like he is, and I wasn't going to have my child in there. So it really got hot and heavy once Gowker came into play. Was there, in fact, a CPS investigation? Yes, ma'am, there was. And at the end of that, were you awarded full custody? I was awarded temporary custody uh, at that point, uh, further the judge would have to go further into it. We had went to a mediation. I showed up. Amanda did not. And it was some years. It was it was about a year and a half before we could get Amanda back into the court system. So at that time, she just said that I, I would be fine with him. And we worked out an agreement that it would be week to week. I wouldn't pay her no child support. She wouldn't pay me no child support. And that was the end of it. And did that week to week custody arrangement work out for many years? Yes, ma'am, it did. So 
So uh, uh, at some point, Amanda got together with Travis Savage and had McKinsey. After after Gowker was arrested, I guess it was just a few months afterwards, we had found out that she was down there with Travis, which lives on, grew up on the street as well. And uh, everything was fine with Travis. Was he a friend of yours? No, he's not a friend of mine. Uh, he was just pretty good with Trey, and I accepted the fact that I wasn't going to be with Amanda, and somebody was. So as long as they were good to Trey, I had no problems with them. When did you learn, or or at some point did you learn, that Galker was back in the picture? I'd heard a rumor that he was back. I'd originally called Amanda, and she said, oh, no, he's not back. He's not back. And um, I guess it was about a month afterwards that I saw him for myself, so then I knew that he was back. Um, what and that would have been that would have been 2010, uh, somewhere around October. And were you aware of where he had been all these years? Yes, ma'am. He was in prison. During this time, did you ever see Josh Young? I didn't see him until sometime after February of 2011. Well, during the whole childhood of, of Trey, did you did you know who Josh Young was? Yeah, I knew Josh Young. I'd been down to his mother's house when he was a little bitty baby. Okay. Was she also somebody from the neighborhood? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you know Trey and Josh Young to be friends? I knew of them to play together off and on throughout throughout their life. There was a short period of time that Angie was no longer living on the street, and nor was Joshua Young. And then a couple years later, I guess time frame would have been Trey was six, seven years old. Um, riding bicycles up and down the road. I noticed Josh Young to be back, uh, had knowledge of his grandmother and mother living in the apartment complex behind my grandmother's house. But then as fast as I noticed they'd be in there, they were gone, and I hadn't seen him since then. So from the time Trey was, did you say seven or eight, until Galper came back in the picture, he was not seen around the neighborhood, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, no. Well, can you describe what happened when, in October of 2010, with how the family dynamics continued? Well, I had confronted Amanda about him being back. I'd even made a phone call to, to uh, the court system just to make sure our agreement was still in effect from uh, the 99 issue of custody and Galker being involved in the home. And it... You know, Can I interrupt you for one second? Was he specifically not supposed to be in the home per the custody arrangement? No, ma'am. She was never supposed to have him back around Trey at all. <coughs> but um, but I heard that Galker was back, and I think there was a lot of um, times that they were argumentative, and Trey was just kind of shipped back to me uh, to shield him from some of those arguments that were going on down there. And he kind of relayed to me what was some of the stuff going on in the home, but he kept a lot of it to himself because of the fact he knew I was going to take him out of that home. And why, if you know, why would he want to stay in that home? He has a little sister there that he loved very much so, and that her name was Mackenzie. And he had already told me that he would do whatever it took to protect Mackenzie. Can you describe for the jury the place where Trey was found? Uh, what, what type of place that is? What type of things go on there? Well, when I was a kid, we used to go down there because it is a drainage ditch. It does have a lot of a lot of the a little pool there. As you walk into, there's a big long tunnel that goes underneath the school, and it actually goes underneath the school. Uh, and you can go underneath there, and it's a concrete that's usually only got less than a quarter inch of water onto the concrete. But nonetheless, there was small fish, small turtles, stuff of that nature in there. Then later became a hangout spot for the kids to paint their graffiti on the underneath side of the school. Uh, and I'm sure it, as they, <coughs> any anybody, they had a nice hiding spot to smoke cigarettes and stuff. And is that someplace where 
neighborhood kids had historically always gone to hang out. Yes, ma'am. Can you get there straight from Vim Drive? Without basically invading anyone's property. Yes, ma'am. And are all these ditches used as cut throughs for neighborhood people? Yes, ma'am. To your knowledge, had Trey ever gone down to that ditch by himself at night? Not by himself uh, at night. I mean, really, I what happened at Amanda's was at Amanda's. I, you know didn't pay attention to a lot of the stuff down there. I didn't like none of it, so, you know, um, I just kind of kept my mouth shut to a lot of it, but I wasn't involved in a lot of it either. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know Trey's Amanda life. Okay. To your knowledge, had he ever gone down there with Josh, Josh Galker? No, I had no open knowledge that he went down there with Josh Galker. Can you describe for the jury, well, Tell them the last time you saw Trey. I saw Trey. I took him to work on Mother's Day. He had to be there at 9. And Where did he, he work? He worked at McDonald's on Taylorsville Road in Bardstown Road. Okay. And, um, and he was 14? <coughs> yes, ma'am. How long had he had that job? Just a couple, very few months. He, had, uh, it was a, he was 14 years old, so he couldn't really work that many hours. He worked Saturdays and Sundays like a full day and none during the week um, but that that day is the last day I saw him and it was Mother's Day of 2011 and I took him to work and he had texted me around lunchtime and he said dad uh, mom's gonna bring me by to get my school stuff and I'm just gonna go have lunch have dinner with her after we Travis brings McKenzie back and I said that was fine. Uh, Amanda also had worked at that McDonald's, so she was just going to bring him home. I took him. She was going to bring him home. And he came by, I guess it was 4 to the, 4 30, 5 o'clock, somewhere around in there. I was sitting on the couch watching TV. He got his school books and everything ready for school, and he came in and he gave me a kiss and said, I'll see you next week. Uh, we were talking about our fishing trip we had already had planned for that following Friday. And uh, he would, he left. Did you typically communicate with him while he was down at Amanda's? Yes, ma'am. I, I stayed pretty close to Trey uh, as far as text. That particular week that he was murdered, I did not. I had started a big job down in Trimble County, and I didn't have that good a signal on my phone. And by the time I got home, I was pretty tired, so I kind of laid down and and didn't think nothing about it. Can you tell the jury what happened on May 11th? On May the 11th, I'd, uh, I'd went to work that morning uh, finishing up a rough on a log cabin, and uh, I'd actually had a pretty good day that day. Uh, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what... I don't think we establish what you do for a living, so they might not know what you meant by that. What do you do? I am an electrician. I own my own electrical company. Okay. Sorry uh, to interrupt. And I'd, uh, I'd actually had a pretty good day that day. I'd got everything that needed to be done and ready for inspection. So I came home. It was 4.35 o'clock, somewhere around when I got home. And um, I went straight to the refrigerator, grabbed a 20-ounce Mountain Dew out of the refrigerator, and, and I... We don't smoke in our home, so I stepped right back out the door and kicked up my feet on the back patio and uh, had a Mountain Dew and a cigarette. When I received a phone call, the phone number that came through was from my buddy uh, Walter Hudson's cell phone, and he had told me he had a detective there that wanted to talk to me. And I don't really remember what the detective told me his name was or anything like that. All I remember is he said, Mr. Zwicker, we've got a problem up here at the school. You need to come find your son. And, of course, I only have one son, so I jumped straight up. I called Terry on the phone and uh, told her that I was heading to Vim Drive, that there was something wrong with Trey, but I didn't know what. Well... I went to Amanda's house and knocked on the door and nobody answered. So I went to my buddy's house that the cell phone call came from and nobody answered. And then I, on the way 
way back from my buddy's house. I didn't. I was running out of options, and nobody was answering their phone. And I remembered that the detective told me we have a problem at the school, and there's only one school in that vicinity, and it's Liberty High School. Well, I went down the alleyway. You can see on the picture here the alley that goes behind Amanda's house. And, and you can use that laser pointer if you want to <coughs> highlight it up there on the screen. This alleyway right here, I had cut down this street, went right down this alley, and there was, uh, it was this alley, sorry. Bobby Bryant was standing there. I pulled my truck up, up and I threw the, him the keys. And by the time I got to this, there's a si this is a sidewalk that goes all the way to the school. By the time I got to here, all this was full of cop cars, and there was a big taped-off area. And I ran up to this point, and that's where I was intercepted by a few detectives. And they brought me over to this side of the area. Uh, and that's where we kind of waited in limbo to find out what was going on. And then I was approached by Detective Russ, I do believe, and he had a packet of papers in his hand, and he told me to calm down, and that the, what he had in his hand was all the kids that didn't go to school that day, and my child was one of them. And I had told him that I had done tried to call Trey and text Trey and was getting no response. And, of course, uh, I think I told him I wasn't ignorant, and I knew he had something down there in that ditch that I needed to go see. He wasn't going to let me go down there, but I told him that my son don't not answer my phone calls. There's something wrong with him. And he had told me to wait, and then they returned a few minutes later and told me that I could walk down there to the ditch and uh, look at what they had, but I would be a probably about 50 feet away is the best he could do for me. And of course it didn't take two seconds to look over there and know that, that was my boy laying there. Did you stay at the scene for quite some time? I don't remember. Okay. Do you remember seeing Amanda at the scene? Yeah, I remember. Do you remember noticing anything about her physical appearance that struck you? No. Do you remember t talking to Detective Stalvi about marks on her neck? Yes, I do. And can you describe what those marks look like to you? They look like bruises. They were perfect squared. They told me they were hickeys. I didn't believe that. That, you know... We were in our 30s. Uh, and I'm sorry, just for the record, you spoke to Detective Ross, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, one second. <coughs> Thank you very much. The defense probably has questions for you now. Cross examination. something about that uh, supposedly a week prior to there was a group of black boys that came out of his apartment on from Indian Trail and uh, he had asked me about that and they said Trey was involved and however it wasn't Trey it was Joey Ballard and Josh Cole it was over a cell phone right. um, did you felt the development of that situation Yeah, I did. I mean... Well, let me just ask you this. Um, Trey had never told you anything about problems with any four black kids? 
No. And you didn't push that story with the with the police, did you? No, I didn't. I I had confronted Trey. I mean, that was a rumor on the street that they were beating up like a grown man a week prior to that. And I just told him that, you know, if people are coming out of that messing with people on the street, you don't you don't stick around, you get away. And certainly you were not suggesting that as a uh, those kids as possible perpetrators. No, not at all. I, you know, the the man that they had fought with was a grown man. Surely they didn't want nothing to do with a 14-year-old boy. And you didn't think that there was any connection with those boys in his murder? No, I didn't have, no, <coughs> I didn't have no knowledge of that, or would have thought that. Uh, do you remember you, you you said that you and Gawker went back to middle school, sixth grade, or something? Do you remember telling? Uh, Detective Russ, that you all went back to kindergarten. We might, I may have. I, I probably said a lot of things in that car. I just getting getting information into Detective Russ' his hands. I just looked over a ditch, and Josh Gowker was moved down here, and he was. I know he was just a part of the. He was part of the neighborhood boys, uh, uh, and we were all friends since that. kindergarten. Uh, you didn't go back to kindergarten? You know? I, I don't believe you. No, Josh didn't go back to kindergarten. He came about in middle school. But all of us boys on that street were friends since kindergarten. Um, now, you talked about Angie. Yep. And Angie is Joshua Young's mother. Yes. And you were friendly with her for a while. Yes. You dated her for a while? I have. Dated her before Galker did. Yeah, we, uh, I dated her before we were even teenagers. Is there uh, some resentment on the part that you were aware of because you had dated Angie? Not that I was aware of. At what point? I think you you had even said you told um, uh, Detective Russ that you uh, you hated Galker. Yes, sir, I did. What, what point in time did you hate him? At the time, I realized that there was just no, he's, for, Galker's always been a thief, and I drew the line at that point, and then it turned out to pretty much all the boys on the street didn't want nothing to do with him, and we all had problems with him, but he was always a thorn that popped up in your side, you know, if he was walking down the street, he walked down the driveway just to start something with you, and Pretty much, I hate's a strong word. I've disliked him most of his life. He didn't last long from the time he came. But not very long. Like he's even made threats on your life, has he? He's been doing that since we were kids. But even during this case, while this case has been going on, he said he wished he had killed. Him. <coughs> yeah, yeah. I heard the interview that he said, "I wish I'd have done this to Terry and Amanda." In the the. Uh, feelings that you have for them certainly never reached any of that level. You just wanted your family to be away from him. Yeah. I never thought about hurting, hurt killing him or anything like that. I just didn't like you him and didn't have nothing. It, it had to be terribly distressing to you when you found out he was back in the neighborhood in October. Yeah. Triggered a huge fight between me and my wife. You found out in the fall that he was living back at a man Yes, sir. You knew that Joshua Young was living there as well? From what I understood, Joshua Young was coming on supervised visits all the way until February. That's all the information I have on that. But he did, he, at some point in time before Trey's death, he was like, he was living there? Yes. And Trey was spending some time with Joshua? Yes. You knew about that? Yes. Um, Trey had his cell phone. Yes. He could text up from that phone? Yes. And you could text from yours? Yes. Did you told him to text you if any problems came up between? Most definitely. you were concerned about his safety while he was there? Yes, I was. Gowker and Amanda? Yes. And Trey was concerned about uh, his mom getting hurt? I was concerned about Mackenzie. Never said anything about his mama to me at all.
He just said that I wanted him to come to my house and live, and I'd had several conversations that all he had to do was say it, and I would bring him out of there, and he had told me that he had to be there for McKenzie. He didn't want McKenzie to get hurt? No. You got some texts from Trey when things were bad? I have texts from Trey and Amanda. I don't have them physically. No, I mean, you, you have? Yes. Uh, and let me back up just a minute and, and go back to when you were looking at the map and you were uh, pointing out where Cassie's house is and where Amanda's house was. And you were talking about fences. Mm -hmm. Were those fences there uh, two years ago, too? Do you remember? Or was that, you said that they're there. Yeah. Uh, Do you remember if they were there two years ago? Yeah, the, the house in the middle was originally uh, another neighborhood buddy. His name was Jamie Allen, and that yard's always been fenced in. Um, did Detective Russ ask you who, uh, if, if Gallagher was capable of killing Trey when, when uh, the interview came about? Do you remember at being asked I, that question? I, I think I vaguely remember it towards the end of it, if I thought he would be capable enough to do it. And you said yes? Most definitely I said yes. And um, he also asked you if you thought that Trey would go down to the, sp I'm talking about the spot, is the the place where his body was found with yes. Galker, and you said yes, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. I believe that he would do that. You're not any uh, aware of any problems that Trey had with Little Josh? No, he never said anything. Um, I had asked him a question about little Josh, and he just said that little Josh was different uh, than he was, um, and that was about it. And never any problems? No, not that um, I did, um, I, I know you're a smoker, but I assume that you don't want your kids to smoke or didn't want your, your son to smoke? Correct. He would get in trouble if he did smoke? Yes, sir. And you had to discipline him when you found out that he was smoking? I never per se found out he was smoking. Um, I'd uh, confront him about it, but at my home, I can guarantee you he didn't smoke. Uh, I live on a busy street, and there wasn't a lot of friends over there, so he spent the majority of time in the house or out in the backyard with our little girl, and my wife don't work, so she was always home. and never found a cigarette lighter or anything like that in his, in his room or no cigarettes and you know we had uh, we have our cigarettes usually I have mine on me never really light them down and like I said we don't smoke in our home because my daughter has a lung issues. Are you a stickler for uh, kids getting a good education? Very much so. And um, you're, I think you described yourself as a very strict parent. Yes, I was. And prior to Trey's death, you had had him on punishment for about three weeks and been grounded? Yes, sir. Um, and when he entered, when he had his friends, or when he was around his friends most of the time, he didn't have them up at your house, did he? Donovan came up quite a bit. I think I remember seeing uh, Joey Ballard and Joshua Cole maybe once or twice. But mainly they just, you know, Donovan would come over and get him, and then they would... Uh, Go out somewhere. Go out somewhere. Uh, there's a church about two doors down from where we live at, and they had a basketball goal set up there. I could actually walk out behind my garage and look down and see. Uh, but they went about two doors down, or they would ride their bikes across the street. There's an elementary school right across, and there's a, um, a turnaround right there. He would ride his bike or skateboard or whatever they chose to do right there, and it was in full vision of my home. Uh, and going back to the, the four black kids and the Bridgewood kids, was there a lot of talk in the neighborhood among people in the neighborhood that uh, his death had to do something with these four black kids? Originally, yes, sir, there was. Uh, there was blame, but only from what I understand, it, it was Josh Galker and Amanda that was saying that it was some little kid named Ray Ray. Was there a meeting at church about the problems with uh, black kids from, that you're aware of? That I, I'm not meeting? aware of any. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Redirect. Uh, 
I, I did, just didn't hear an answer when you were asked um, what Trey said about Josh Young. What did you say? I said that, you know, we had talked to each other about Josh Young, or I said that I had asked about Josh Young, and he said he said he was just different human being. He wasn't really used to Joshua. He was just a different person. You know, it wasn't nothing bad, or he didn't have any problems with him. He just didn't know how to take him. Didn't know how to take him? That's where I perceived it. I didn't ever really push it. No, I didn't know Joshua Young that well. I'd seen him around the neighborhood and only remember a few conversations vaguely. Okay. Nothing further. Three cross. Yes, sir. Uh, just in the abundance of caution, uh, we would ask that the witness be available, possibly for uh, redirect, or for, uh, in our cases, to be called as a witness. Okay. We will permit that. Um, Mr. Zwicker, that means that the Commonwealth has your contact information. They'll be able to reach you. Because you're subject to recall as a witness, you won't be permitted to stay into the courtroom until you're released as a witness. Can we approach on that real quick? Yes, come on. And I've been forgetting to do. If you'll come back up, I haven't been letting the jury ask questions. Does the jury have a question for Mr. Zwicker? That is a fair request. I'll take care of that. Nobody has a question for Mr. Zwicker? Okay. Now, sorry about that. You can go. As part of our technology pilot project, that's something that I have also noticed. Um, but I'm not positive how to fix it. Ben, will you see if you can just lay that monitor down or bring it down on the... Let's first try and see if we can bring it down to the exhibit table. There you go, I think. That Ben, he's worth a million dollars. So maybe half a million. That's good. That works. That does the trick. That way we can put it back. See it, but well, if we need to use it, we can put it back up. Thank you. All right, come on, let's next witness. Your Honor, the Commonwealth calls Detective Lee Maroney to the stand. Detective Lee Maroney. Detective Maroney, if you'll come up to the witness stand, please. I'm going to place you under oath. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be truthful? Yes, sir. 
Thank you. Have a seat. Be comfortable. I encourage you to sit up close to the microphone. It's adjustable for your height. Keep your voice up good and loud so we can all hear your testimony. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you please state your name for the record? Yes, my name is Lee Maroney. Where are you employed? The Louisville Metro Police Department. In what capacity are you employed there? I'm assigned to the homicide unit. I'm a detective in that unit. How long have you been with homicide? I uh, started there in 2004 and uh, left briefly in 2008 for about 10 months and then went back. Uh, and how long have you been with the police department? Uh, I was hired on by the county police in 1998. Uh, what are your job duties as a homicide detective? Um, to respond to a scene, um, to gather facts, uh, look for evidence, um, work with other detectives, uh, assign tasks if you're the lead detective, and maintain a case file. And you, you mentioned being a lead detective. Um, what does it mean to be a lead detective? Uh, it means you're the lead investigator on the case. Um, you're in charge of maintaining the, ca the case file itself, uh, presenting the case to the Commonwealth Attorney uh, when and if charges are to be brought against uh, a specific person or persons, um, and to assign other detectives within your unit to assist you with tasks in that case. And how is a lead detective assigned to a case? On a rotation basis. Okay. And um, how many detectives are in homicide? Um, approximately 22. And how often um, do you get assigned as the lead if you rotate? Um, of those 22 detectives, about five of them are assigned to a cold case or a missing persons detective, so they're not in an active homicide investigation rotation. The other 16 or 17 of us, basically, um, if I'm at the top of the list, I pick up one, um, I go down to the bottom of the list. So 16 additional homicides will have to come out again before I'm the actual lead detective. Okay. And did you, in fact, pick one up this morning? Yes, I've been out <laughs> since 2 o'clock. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. I'm trying to get you out of here as soon That's as we okay. can. That's okay. I'm happy to be here. Uh, were you working on May 11th of 2011? Yes, ma'am, I was. And did you get called out to a scene? I did. How do you get called out to a scene? Do you all answer 911 calls, or how do you all find out about a scene? Uh, no, we're notified by uh, dispatch over our police radios um, to respond to a scene. Um, a lot of times the uh, first responding officers within a division will respond. They'll be the first officers on scene, and they'll advise that uh, that they have a shooting, stabbing, um, whatever it may be, person down, um, and they determine if the person is if the d person is deceased on the scene that the homicide unit is going to be notified or not. And a lot of times, uh, their injuries are critical, but they don't die. Uh, but we're still notified if it looks to be a life-threatening injury, and we will then respond uh, to the hospital to advise whether or not it's going to be our case or a district-level detective. Okay, and. Um you said that you did get called out. Do you know what time you got called out on the 11th? I believe it was one, I have it in my investigative letter, that it was around, uh, I put 13, 20 hours, which is 1.20 in the afternoon. Okay, what's an investigative letter? Uh, it's a, basically a summary of the steps that you take in an investigation, um, summarized in an investigative letter. And uh, what, what happens with those investigative letters? Do you keep them, or do they get dispersed? What happens? No, they are um, typed up, uh, signed by myself, and provided to a sergeant who then reviews the letter, uh, signs the letter himself, and then they're given to the lead detective in the case. Okay. Um, how many homicides do you, um, cases, do you think you've worked on since... Mm -hmm. 2004 mm -hmm. minus a 10 month hiatus um, on average. On average, I would say, um, gosh, I could say we get roughly anywhere from, I'm going to say an average year is 50 or 60, and I would probably get anywhere from three to six in a year that I'm the lead on. Um, however, I would assist in um, a large number, so I would say in the hundreds. Okay. And so can you remember all of the mm -hmm. details, like 
time you get called out on all of the cases that you've worked? No. And a, lot, a lot of times we're called into cases and we do a summary uh, because the case may not go to trial for several years and our, you know, we pick up numerous death investigations, suicides, um, and additional homicides within that time period, so it's hard to keep everything straight, so we do an investigative letter. Okay, and you, you mentioned you referred to it for the date. Do you have your full investigative letter in front of you? Yes. Okay. Um, so you stated that you got called out, you recorded in your letter on May 11th about 1320 or 120 in the afternoon. What did you do when you got called out? Um, actually, dispatch actually called me and had me call them on the phone instead of giving me details over the radio. Um, I called them and they just, I don't know why they chose on this particular case, but um, they just stated that they had been um, dispatched to a, what appeared to be a decomposing body uh, found behind Liberty High School. And perhaps they thought because of the nature, it was behind the school and school was uh, still in session at the time that it, they didn't necessarily want to draw a lot of attention to it because a lot of people have scanners and they can hear the radio. Okay. So you got the you called dispatch at their request and learned about the body behind Liberty. What did you do next? Um, I started to the scene. And what did you do when you got to the scene? Um, prior to getting to the scene, um, I had not been advised that it was um, anything other than uh, a sus suspicious death or de appeared to be a decomposing body. I wasn't notified it could be a homicide or anything of that nature. And we have two separate rotations: ones for death investigations, and then one, is, and that's per platoon which we pick up far more of those uh, up as on an individual basis than we do as a, as a homicide. We do it as a unit basis. So I called the lead detective that was on the rotation for a death investigation, which was Keith Roberts, and uh, he proceeded to the, to the scene as well. And I arrived on scene, and he had arrived before I had, and uh, he advised me at that point that this was not going to be a death investigation and that he had placed a call to Detective Russ, who was on the top of the list for a homicide. Okay. And um, you said you spoke, did you speak with Detective Roberts there at the scene or on the phone or both? Uh, well, uh, on the phone to notify him, and then upon my arrival, he was already there and we okay. spoke at the scene. And then, so what did you do next? Um, I followed Detective Roberts down to the scene itself um, and um, noted the officers that were on the scene in my notes um, and basically got a and I uh, looked at the scene to kind of look at what we had, uh, the age of the uh, victim and the general surroundings. And what did you see when you first, you said you went down there. Can you describe uh -huh. to the jury sort of what yeah. the, the, the topography is, <laughs> sure. I guess, in that area? Um, when I arrived, I arrived into the back lot of Liberty High School. Uh, it was a parking lot, I guess, mostly where staff parks. And um, the, the building itself was to the right. And to the left, I think there was a, a ball field and kind of um, grassy area. Um, and in between the two, there was a, a fence, and you had to walk down the fence or, or between an open fence way to get down to, I don't know if you call it a creek bed or a ditch line. I noted it as, as a creek bed. It seemed a little wider to me than a ditch line. So, And then um, there was kind of a um, tunnel or a, a, a culvert. Cody, However, whatever. The tunnel? Yes. Um, that went over the creek bed that you could drive over. And the school, again, was on your right. And the body was located uh, very close to the water in a face-down position um, with black clothing on. Okay. What, um, when you first get to a scene, and this is, I guess, in general, as well as, as well as specifically to this one, when you first get to a scene, you said you wanted to go down and just kind of see what you had. Are you going to start touching things and no. collecting things? What are you going to do? Um, I'm just going to get a look at it because it's really up to the lead detective. A lot of times lead detectives are particular. They may want to work their own scene. Um, we don't touch anything at all. We just um, we'll get in, uh, we try to limit the number of people that get there in the first place, but since we were the first ones there and we could advise Detective Russ a little bit further, uh, we kept our distance, but just got a an, an, an idea of what the scene entailed. Uh, we didn't start touching anything in, until uh, Detective Russ got there, and even then we don't touch anything. We just make note of where they are until they're collected by our crime scene unit. So you checked out, got an idea of what you had. What were you able to observe from a sort of distance when you just wanted to see what 
kind of evaluate what kind of case you were dealing with? Um, just the location of the body. You don't know if they had where they face down in the water, you know, it's hard to hard to tell at that point. Uh, but um, once you got a little closer, you could kind of see blood on the back of the victim's head. Um, I think one of his arms was outstretched. I think it might have been his right arm. Um, he had a short sleeve uh, black T-shirt on, and it looked like blood or a little bit of spatter maybe on his arm. Um, blood pooling underneath his face. Um, and just like bottles and kind of debris in the area that may or may not have be of any significance, we don't know. But so, what did you do next? Um, uh, don't know if Detective Russ had arrived at the scene at that point or not. Um, but normally, we're not going to do much with the scene, uh, but we'll do what we can with the time uh, because these scenes take quite a bit of time. We try to go ahead and use logic and do what we think because we've been doing to get this a long time and we've worked together I kind of know what he would expect of me and that would be um, to start to identify and interview any witnesses that may be in the area so I, I spoke to I think two different neighbors that lived on Kramer's or about that area um, just to see if they heard anything saw anything unusual and um, and then, do you know with whom you spoke? Do you know their names, or do you uh, have them recorded? I have them recorded. I spoke to a, a gentleman named Lonnie Ray Skaggs and uh, Dylan Rodriguez and um, an individual named Mike Dunn who didn't have any information, just heard about what was going on and showed up at the scene. Okay. Or in the area, not at the scene. So. In the area? Yeah. When, you, yes. when you've got a crime scene, um, the jury heard from Officer Pinger who talked about putting up some crime scene tape. Yes. Was that up when you got there or being put up when you yes. got there? I so, um, yeah. Do you, as a detective, are you concerned about um, letting people mill about together or separating them? What sort of steps are you going to want to take when you first get to a scene if there are people around? Um, if there's people around, we ideally we'd like to separate the witnesses and talk to them separate of one another because we don't want one person's testimony or one person's statement to be overheard by another to maybe influence oh yeah well and they sometimes will just hear what they say and say yeah you know or I heard that but I'm not really a witness to that I just heard him say it and we just want their account of what they heard or what they saw and when you spoke with um, Mr. Skaggs and Mr. Rodriguez and Mr. Dunn where did you speak with them um, I spoke to Mr. Skaggs um, in the area of his mother's house, which was located at 1316 Kramer's, um, and it was out in his front yard or on the sidewalk or driveway, but outside. You've been talking about Kramer's. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes, ma'am. Didn't know if the standing tree for Philip Lawrence. Thank you. Um, Detective, I've got what has been marked and, and entered as Commonwealth's one and three, okay. and um, having no ability at geography myself, I have mm -hmm. no idea if Kramer's is on either of these maps or if you can give an idea, if I were to put them up for the jury, what sort of area, if this is Liberty yeah. High School. I want to say this is Kramer's right here. Okay. If I'm going to put it up so the jury okay. can see it and I'll let you show them. Okay. Which exhibit is this? I'm sorry, thank you, Your Honor. It's Commonwealth One. Thank you. And you indicated to me, is this the street? That appears to be Kramer's to me. Okay. So is that where you um, interviewed Mr. Skaggs? Yes. Okay, and what about Mr. Rodriguez? Uh, interviewed him, uh, would have been in the same area, or in the same area on Kramer's, I don't, I did not specify the exact address, so it would have been uh, not at a specific location, but on the street or on the sidewalk. Standing sidewalk-ish. outside. Yes. And also with Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn, he was just standing on the corner closest to the crime scene tape at Kramer's at the school. Okay. Um, so you spoke with them. Did you learn anything no, of import? Okay. No. What did you do next? Um, at that point, I was initially told that um, I would be doing the scene investigation, but that 
kind of changed when um, my, I believe it was my sergeant asked me to interview Amanda Campbell. The um, we had not identified the body to be that of, of Trades Wicker, but his mother was on scene and um, he wanted me to go and interview her and get some information. It, before you did that, did you walk through oh, the yeah. scene at all? Yes, I did. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, um, Detective Russ and I, because there was a, um, a creek bed, we thought, well, let's go look through the creek bed if we can to see if there's any evidence. Of course, we don't touch the body or move the body. We don't know for sure, and we can't roll them over or anything like that until the investigation is complete and the coroner arrives at the scene. So we don't know if there's bullet holes. Um, we don't know if he's been stabbed. We don't know anything on the front of the body. So we're looking for any evidence at this point. Or, And from what we could see, it looked like he may have been struck with a blunt force object. But then again, it's hard. These are uh, pictures at the school, at the scene, um, in the surrounding area. Um, this is, I believe, the parking lot that I entered. Um, this is the school itself, and this would be where the entrance is to the, to where the body was. Um, this is a better location. Uh, we, we went in here. There was a fence over in this area. We went down towards the creek bed. This is a closer view of the entry point. And then this is um, the tunnel area and the creek bed that we entered underneath with our flashlights. Do those photos all fairly and accurately represent the scene as it was when you arrived that day? Yes. We move to admit Commonwealth 5 through 9 into evidence. Any objection to 5 through 9? No objection, Your Honor. Introduced into evidence. Permission to publish? Yes. Just so the jury can see a little bit of what were just describing. This is Commonwealth 5. Can you explain <coughs> what you were describing there? Uh, I believe that, that, that is the parking lot that I pulled into um, behind that fence there, and this goes along the, the side of the school, um, which leads down to the creek bed. Sorry, we're going to move the flip chart on the way, and I've actually got pointer so you can okay. the bottom button okay if you want to indicate Jones Brown if you'll hit the light wire over there. Okay. So in the distance what are we seeing there? Uh, right there is the parking lot. Um, and this would be the parking lot that I entered here. I believe this comes straight up to the school and uh, sorry. Um, and then this would be the area that we went into to locate the body. And this is Commonwealth 6. Would it be fair to say that that's 
That's where we were just side. looking? <laughs> yes, that's the opposite side of the parking lot. Um, and the view you were just looking at was from here to here. Okay. And then you talked a little bit about number seven. And this is generally in this area, right over in here is, um, is where we entered. I don't know if it's here or over in this area. But um, this is the general area of entry to get to the creek bed. So this is down right at the level where the creek bed is? Uh, it's not at the level of the creek bed, but it is the, the pathway to get to go down to, to the go creek down. bed. Yes. Okay. And then Commonwealth 8 and 9. And this is the creek bed itself, and this is the overpass here, that, and this is the, the end of that tunnel. So we walked quite a ways before we got down to this tunnel. It empties out down here. Okay. Thank you. And you said that you all also um, located some items. Um, <laughs> leave the lights off. Please. Um, that you located some items uh, and noted things that you all might find of interest. You mentioned specifically the lawnmower blade. Mm -hmm. Were there other items that you saw there? There were uh, plastic bottles, uh, cigarette butts, um, I think a cigarette package, empty cigarette package. Um, maybe a candy wrapper, um, and then of course blood on different areas like uh, tree limbs or uh, rocks surrounding the body. Uh, in a moment I'm going to show you what I have tentatively marked as Commonwealth 10 through 40. And I'd like you to take a look at those and let me know if they fairly and accurately represent the items that you all found on the scene as you were walking. You're going to let us take a restroom break. Um, we'll let Detective Maroney review those during that break, and then we'll come back and talk about those in detail. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember your admonition. Be ready to come back in in 10 minutes at 2.45. All rise for the departing jury. All rise, please. Sleep if we let you go back. I'm just glad you got a shower. Oh, me or him? I didn't. <laughs> Yo, I thought you were going to get to. I'm sorry. I was like, as soon as I got <laughs> Well, you look great. Oh.
Yeah, we'll just burn it to put it in the records. I have one. I mean, I'll just say that. Right, well, we just have some. They're all from here. No, I'm not. These are the rest. Okay. Nobody can tell me that.
the attorneys up here just a minute, please. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Detective Maroney, before we broke, I'd handed you um, some photos numbered 11 through 40. Did you have an opportunity to review those during the break? I did. And do those photos fairly and accurately represent the scene um, and the items that you all pointed out when you were walking through the scene that afternoon? Yes. I would move to admit Commonwealth's 11 through 40 in the evidence. No, I think it's 10 through 40. Uh, it is 10 through 40. Okay. I'm sorry, it was five through nine. Yes. Any objection to the introduction of those photographs? As subject to what we've said. Other than what we've discussed at the bench. Yes. Introduced into evidence. Thank you. Permission to publish some of those photos to the jury. Yes. All right, Detective, I'm just going to walk through, walk you through a few of these so that you can kind of let the jury see what you do when it is you're going through a scene and, and how you pick out um, what might be important or determine what might be important. Uh, what, is the, what is the jury seeing right here? Um, it's evidence marker one and two uh, for two different items. The first item is, uh, I believe it's a pair of black sweatpants. And oops, that would be a closer view. Uh, okay. And then you said item two. Uh -huh. And that is a, a pack of Marlboro cigarettes. Okay. And those were um, next to the school? Is they were next to the school, not next to the body, but we didn't know the relevance, but close enough proximity that we thought we'd take. And this is, I'm sorry, for the record, this is Commonwealth Detective, 13. would you do me the favor of turning our lights down? Mm -hmm. 
Commonwealth 13, um, would you draw to what are you, you all trying to capture here? Um, that's marker number three. It was an item, I think it's a pack of uh, cigarillos, which is like a, a cigar, kind of like a, a swisher sweet. And then this is, I'm going a little on board. This is 17. Oops. Where was this one left? This was in the creek bed, and I believe this is going to be the lawnmower blade. And it's a dark photo because it's in the. Um, underneath. This might be yeah, a little better. That one's better. Is this the lawnmower blade? Yes. Okay. And that was in the tunnel? Yes. I go through Commonwealth's 18. We did one, two, three, and then ten. <laughs> um, do you all? Why do you all use those markers? The yellow markers? Uh huh. Uh, just to keep account of what exhibit number is what. Okay, and then there is a piece of what looks like maybe tape over to the right. It's a, a measurement. Mm -hmm. Close up. What is the? What is that about? What, why is that there? And what is it next to? It's just a sticky uh, sticker with. Uh, small ruler just gives us measurements um, like in this we look like uh, what appeared to be a blood spot here and I think there's another one down here and it's just giving you a measurement okay of how big that spot is Commonwealth 20 I think that's what we were just looking at. Um, On number nine. Number nine, yeah, okay. with the two spots there. Um, yeah. From here, I think this is a concrete. It's hard to tell. Uh, this is a con piece of concrete with blood spatter on it. Down here. And then in that bigger picture, there were six and seven as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the six is kind of a, a, a small tree trunk to a small tree. I believe if I have a closer picture, I can't really tell from here, but with blood spatter on it as well, or blood on it. Then there are also, there was a number five. This is Commonwealth 35. Yeah, that's the piece of, uh, I think it's the, uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure if it was the candy wrapper or if it was this. Back here that to capture the yeah, I'd have to look at the CSU. We'll have a more detailed report on that. Okay, and then Commonwealth number thirty-eight. Mm -hmm. We uh, in there just a, a plastic water bottle. Okay, and Commonwealth thirty-nine is this um, that same marker here with the water bottle? Yes, right here. Why? Why do you have? Uh, why are there pictures taken from so many different distances and angles? Um, you want to get a general view. Um, you want to get a general view of where the evidence is in proximity to the scene as well as the body itself. Um, and then you want to get a more specific picture of what it is you're collecting. Okay. And um, is that the common practice that you all use when you're going through a scene and, and documenting things? As detectives, we don't necessarily document that our crime scene evidence okay. unit does that, and um, but yes, that is their standard practice. Okay. And then just a couple of more to see where some of the markers were. Um, this is Commonwealth 26. Okay. Um, and this is wrong. This is the victim's body here, obviously, uh, and these are the. That's the tree, small tree trunk here, roots of a tree trunk. So are these where some of the blood spatter, or I guess suspected blood spatter, because obviously it hasn't been tested no yet. testing has been done at the scene? That's correct. Okay. Um, I believe you also have um, with you Commonwealth's 41 to 49. Thank you. Do you have those in front of you? Yes. 
And do those photos fairly and accurately represent um, parts of the scene that you saw that day? Yes. Your Honor, I'll move to admit Commonwealth 41 through 49 into evidence. Any objection to those photos? This is what we said at the bench. Introduced into evidence. Thank you. Permission to publish a few of these, Your Honor? Yes. There are, as I said, this is 41 through 49, so there are a number of photos here, but I just want to look at a couple and ask you to explain um, to the jury, if you are able, what is being captured here in this area. It just looks like a, a large pool of blood right here. And then Commonwealth 44, uh, what is being captured there? Looks like Creek Rock and all of this little brownish red matter appears to be blood spatter, blood drops, blood splatter. Okay. And is that what all of these are in 41 through 49? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Finally, I will, um, I would like you to look at Commonwealth 50 through 68 and see if these fairly represent uh, pictures of Trace Whitmer as you found him. Subject to our discussions at the bench introduced into evidence. Thank you. Permission to publish some of these as well. Yes. Detective, this is Commonwealth 56. Can you tell the jury which? Um, which arm they're seeing on this side of the photo of which of Trey's arms? This is Trey's left arm. And is that under his body? It is under his body. Tell me again the exhibit number. Yes, sir. 56. Thank you. And 57, is that just a close-up of that side there? Yeah. Yes. His arm is right down here. Commonwealth 59. Can you explain what this photo is of? Uh, this is actually the creek bed or the water area over in this area. Um, we actually came down this way. His left arm's tucked under. You can see his fingers right here. And then obviously this is his right arm. So is his, is his body going head down toward the water? Um, or yes. next to the water? Next to the water, yes. Okay. Commonwealth 62. Does that give, let you explain to the jury the position? This is a, a just shooting. This is the way we came in up in here, and this is the creek bed over in here. So it tells you kind of how close he is to the water. And where is the the tunnel that you all went through? Is that tunnel towards his head or, or towards his feet? It's towards his feet. Okay. And in fact, Commonwealth 63. On the left there, is that part the side of the tunnel? Yes, and then it arches over in here. Commonwealth 66, from where is this one taken? It's 
taken from the fence uh, looking down leave right in this area kind of hard to tell but that is the body looking from the fenced area and is that uh, where is that fence in relation to where the police line was that we showed the jury earlier it's well inside the police line the police line was um, at the fence towards the parking lot and then this is a, a, another fence probably 50 yards within inside the, 30 to 50 yards within the crime scene tape. So the crime scene went back quite a ways from where Trey's body was found. Oh, yes. Okay. And you testified that you don't move um, when you first get there. You can't move the body until the medical, uh, until the coroner gets there. Is that correct? Right. We're, we're not allowed to touch the body whatsoever. Okay. Um, after the coroner comes, are you all able to then move the body to do any sort of investigation? We are. Normally it is the coroner, his or herself, whoever's there that actually puts their hands on the body. Um, they may ask us, depending on the size of the person, to assist them with rolling the victim over. Normally it's done when the transport service arrives. Okay. What, what is transport service? Uh, we have a, a, a sis, um we have, a, I guess, a contract with a company called um, TIES. It's short for, I think, Totally Independent Embalming Services. And they come and they pick up uh, any of our deceased victims, and then they will transport the body to a funeral home or to the morgue in cases of homicide or death investigations. Okay. And I have a couple of photos that um, I need to show that are a little more close up. This is Commonwealth 58. Can you explain jury is seeing here. Yeah. Um, this is Trey's head. This is the top of his head here. You can see his t-shirt right here. Uh, this is a large gash in the back of his head and all of these little green um, bits on here are flies. And Commonwealth 67. Um, that appears that once he is actually rolled over, um, you can see some of the marks on his body where the pooling of the blood is, uh, as well as where his body is pressed up against the ground into where the, the, the pool, blood is pooling, uh, settling in his body. Um, and these are all insects, uh, ants. And finally, Commonwealth 68. <laughs> this is Trey's face. I apologize, Robin. Commonwealth 68. Uh, this is Trey's face. This is his two eyes here, his nose, his mouth, and his tongue. Uh, again, these black marks here are um, flies. And this is how his body was found after it was rolled over. Yes. How long um, do you think, or if you have any letter? Um, you got there about 1.20 in the afternoon. You talked to the couple of the neighbors. Right. Um, going through the scene. I you can estimate. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't start an interview with Ms. Campbell, which I talked about earlier, um, until later. Uh, that was, um, I want to say, around four, so approximately two to three hours. Okay. And you did say that you interviewed Ms. Campbell. Um, is that Trey's mother? That's Trey's mother. What time did you start that interview? I have it listed at uh, 1648 hours, which is 448 in the afternoon. And where did you conduct that interview? Uh, the school um, staff was... Some of the staff were there at the school, and they allowed us. It was very, very hot outside. Uh, they had an air conditioning system in the school, and they allowed us to go into the school into one of the um, unused classrooms uh, to do interviews. And was, I interviewed her there. And was anyone else present when you interviewed um, Amanda Campbell or Amanda McFarland? No. What was her um, 
Can you, if you recall, can you describe what her appearance or condition was when you were talking to her? Um, my sergeant asked me to interview her because uh, I believe at the time um, Trey's father had been allowed to view his body at a distance uh, from behind a fence line, um, kind of over that tunnel that we, Detective Russ and I had walked through. Um, and we weren't sure who who it was. Of course, if it is Trey, he's a juvenile. His, his parents want to know if that's him. His father uh, looked at him from a distance and made what he believed to be a positive identification of his son without seeing his face. And based on his reaction, Amanda had a severe emotional outburst. Um, and um, we knew at that point that we needed to do more interviews more quickly um, and that there are other detectives that had arrived on the scene that could continue doing the scene investigation with Detective Russ. So uh, I was the one that was asked to interview Ms. Okay. Campbell. And you said that you were, it was just the two of you in the classroom? Yes. And it started at 1648 or 448? Yes. Um, how long did you speak with her that afternoon, if you know? Let's see. Or about how long? Sometimes I, I will go off tape and I'll give it time. I have to look and see. I went off tape at 17.02, which is 5.02 p.m. So 4.48 to 5.02? Yes, approximately. Uh, Ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. And then um, what did you do next? Uh, from there, I interviewed uh, Josh Gowker. And where did you do that? Uh, in the same classroom. Uh, was it just you with Josh Gowker at that time? No, it was not. Uh, who was there? Amanda Campbell. Uh, reluctantly, I did want to interview him separately because she was emotionally distraught. He was concerned for her. Uh, he told me he was. He, he wanted to keep her close. I said, that's fine if she wants to come in here, but she is not, you know, I need your answers, only your answers, and she does not and cannot chime in or give any answers to any questions I ask you. She was compliant with that. Okay. Um, and do you know what time you started that um, interview or, or interview is the right term? I have 1702, so he was outside waiting, I assume. I brought him immediately in. So it would be 502 p.m. And when did it end? And uh, I don't have a time that I concluded, but I would say it wasn't more than 15, 20 minutes at the most. Okay. And um, that was a recorded interview? Yes, both were recorded interviews. Okay. And um, what did you do next? Um, at that point, I interviewed, uh, I was advised that um, some of Trey's friends had arrived on the scene. So I interviewed um, a young man named Donovan Hudson, which is a cousin. Um, was he was a cousin of Trey's? Amanda called him her cousin. I don't know if it was a second cousin, and her his father was actually her first cousin, but she referred to him as a cousin. Okay. And um, he was he was oh, Trey's sorry. age. I'm sorry. He okay. Was, okay. So he was a, he was a teenager. He was a teenager. Yes. In and school. Where was that interview done? Same classroom. Was anyone present then? Yes, his father. And do you know his father's name? I believe it's Walter. Okay. Hudson. Yes. And how did you record that interview? Yes, I did. About how long, um, if you know or can estimate? Um, probably, again, about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Okay. What did you do next? I interviewed, um, let's see, Joey Ballard. And is he also a teenager? He is. Um, where did you interview him? In the same classroom. Was anyone present then? His mother, Tanya Bray. Okay. Um, did you record that interview? Yes, I did. What did you do next? Uh, there was a little bit of time but between his interview, but then I interviewed Josh Young. And was anyone present when you interviewed the defendant? No. Where was that? The same location. Okay. Um, and did you record that? I did. Did you do anything else on scene that day? Um, not that I recall. Okay. When you um, when you interviewed 
Amanda and Josh Galper and Donovan Hudson and Joey Ballard and Josh Young. Um, was there any discussion um, with those people about any trouble in the neighborhood or trouble with other kids? Yes. Okay. Um, and you stated you did record all of those interviews. Yes. And then what do you do with those recordings? Um, I burn them to a CD and we have those CDs sent to a transcriber and they're transcribed and both the transcription itself as well as the CD is provided to the lead detective for his file. Okay. Um, Your Honor, at this time I would move to admit uh, the defendant's statement. It will be Commonwealth 69 and move to play that into the record. Let's come up first. HDMI cable. Okay. 
Do you know if he had shoes on? Yeah. Okay. You know what kind of shoes? Uh, probably either. They're all black. Mm -hmm. All black. I don't know what kind they are. Okay. And do you all have separate rooms? Yeah. Okay. And did you ever see him go into his room? Uh, well, like, I was in my room. Shower, and that's the last time I seen him, which was already after we ate in the barbecue. Was getting wrapped up. Okay. So, but you know he changed back into his regular clothes. So you had, you saw him between after he got out of the shower. Yeah. Okay. Um, did he say anything to you about? Okay. Um, did he? And I'm just trying to. If you know anything about it, Pete, did he plan on sneaking out or doing anything if like that? He would have told He would have told you? Yeah. Okay. Um, he doesn't really do anything like yeah. that. Had he snuck out a couple times? Maybe. Okay. Did you uh, Did you ever sneak out with him? Mm -hmm. And I don't care. I'm not telling your folks or anything like that. But, uh, we never snuck out. Would you all never we, snuck out? We hang out at our house. Okay. Everybody comes down there every day. Any reason he would have left the house? Not that I can think of. Any reason at all? Like anybody who would have left the house, they called him on the phone or nobody that nobody I can think, think of. of. Okay. Um, if he did sneak out, who do you think he would have met? Well, like I said, like <coughs> just the people that are here is really who all we hang out with. Okay. And who are y'all's closest friends? Donovan, Joey, Josh. Okay. Um, anybody he's particularly been in I mean, arguments been with? Or at their bus stop, like you probably heard from yeah. everybody you've interviewed. Yeah. With. Have you been a party to any of that? Uh, any trouble going on? I don't go to that, don't go oh, to that's that right. school, okay. so I don't get offered to get on the bus there. Do you know any of the kids from the apartments over there after after school that? Bridgewood, no. Yeah. Okay. Um, has he said anybody's name that he's been beefing with? He really didn't have any problems okay. except the bus stop. Okay. And has he mentioned anybody by name from the bus stop? Okay. And has he indicated you know who these kids are, who they're friends with, or what they're doing at the bus stop? They tried to take his phone, okay. gave it back. Okay. That was a couple of weeks ago. Okay. And he say, is he saying whose friends they are, who they're hanging out he with? He doesn't know them, I know. Okay. Probably Ray. You probably already yeah. know that name from everybody, too. Okay. But Ray was close with him like we all are. So Ray's a good guy, yeah. in your all's opinion. Okay. And that is that Ray Carter? I don't know. Was okay. Last night. I've only met him a couple times. Okay. So there's no problems with Ray? To your knowledge, okay. Have you heard any rumors or anybody talking out here that have, that has theories anything. about what happened or nobody knows anything? Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm talking to all the other guys too, and um, told your dad, Amanda, you know, there's going to be rumors flying around about this, and some of them will be true and some of them won't, and uh, that. It's our job to determine which ones are true and which ones are not, but we need to know all of them. So, uh, if you hear anything, of course, tell your dad. Tell me that happened. Call us. Uh, we'll look into it. Um, we don't know a whole lot right now, but these are the early steps that we take in any investigation. But since you were, you know, lived with him and were so close to him, obviously you're a key person that we want to talk to. And, Did you do you know if it, have you been home and have you do you know if his cell phone's at home or I don't know if any of us stuff on those book bags his backpack okay. okay. I didn't see his his shoes weren't where he took them off when he got in the shower, so I'm assuming he had them on. Okay. Well he wouldn't have left the house without shoes. Yeah. And would you have seen him? Do you all get up in the morning at the same time? I get up way earlier because I gotta go to the compound because my school's so far out. Okay. So, 
did you happen to see his room or glance in his room today? No, to his room's upstairs. And you sleep downstairs? And the doors are closed. And then there's the stairs. Okay. And his room's up there, but I didn't even check because he doesn't get up to after me. Does anybody else have a room upstairs? His sister. Okay. And she's how old again? Young? Uh, eight. Eight, I okay. And does she get up around the same time he does? Or? No, okay. she gets up. She's in elementary school, so she gets up later than all of us. Okay. Okay. And do you guys get yourself ready for school, or is your yeah, so Amanda get you up? Ready. Okay. And today, your your mom wasn't working or anything. Uh -huh. What about your dad? Does he work? He wasn't working today. Where's your dad work? I mean, he does all kinds of jobs. Okay. So just whenever somebody needs help. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, if there's anything you can think of, or Anybody you think we should talk to, think about it and let us know. Um, but I appreciate your time. Anything, any questions you have for me? Or? Oh, All right. Thanks for your time. I tried to locate um, <clears throat> two of the additional friends of Trey's that the other juveniles had given me, uh, a boy named Wade and a, a boy named Josh Cole. Um, uh, also went to pick up some store video from a Circle K the next day um, to try and see if uh, Amanda and Josh had been in the store like they said they had been the night Which before. Josh? Uh, Josh Galker. Sorry. And um, and then on the 13th of May, because we'd been given the names of Antoine and just some of the boys from the, the bus stop that were causing the kids in the neighborhood problems, we, we knew of a boy named Antoine, or Tuan is a nickname, and we had a tip that came in um, identifying a boy named Tuan uh, and two other friends that had been arrested and were at the JCYC Juvenile Center. And we got a court order and had all of those boys brought in, and they were subsequently interviewed in reference to this case okay. to see what knowledge they had, if any. You said you did um, pick up a video at the Circle K. Um, where is that Circle K in relation to um, Liberty or Vim Drive, if you know? How far is it? It's not that far, but okay. uh, I can't Walking say Walking exactly. distance or um, quick I, car ride? car ride okay and um, you said that you were you were picking up the tape because it had been reported that Amanda and Galker had gone there is that correct yes I believe I, I don't know where that came from who uh, I guess it was detective Ross or, or somebody had subsequently interviewed him again after I had spoken with him at the scene and they were talking about how they had been at the Circle K that night and calls were made overnight to obtain that video and uh, the video was already on a DVD burned to a disc for us to pick up and I had stopped to pick that up and then reviewed the tape when I brought it back. And did you in fact see them on the video? I did. Okay. One moment. examination I 
didn't really have a primary assignment. Uh, initially, my pro well, originally I was uh, requested to do the scene. And the crime scene unit uh, did arrive there? Yes. And there was a technician, actually two technicians that were that, that appeared? I believe so. And one technician took the video of the scene? Usually, and yeah. Usually, I didn't actually work the scene with them to you say for sure. About some of the stuff that they had marked and yes, pieces, but they yes. were really in a better position to testify about this evidence than you are. Yes. You didn't make detailed notes about no, that. No, sir. So. No. So when you saw those pieces of evidence, you were kind of just like, I remember seeing that. I do remember seeing them. Yes. We should defer questioning about those items to the technicians that actually did that. In terms of how they collected it and. and those questions and how it was stored, documented, swaps, that type of stuff, yes, but I can I can tell you what I saw at the scene, yes. I want to ask you about a little uh, yellow paint okay. fleck. Did okay. you see a little yellow paint fleck at the scene that was taken in evidence? I don't recall that. Okay. Um, when you, when you uh, arrived at the scene, you keep an open mind yes. as to what might be relevant evidence. Yes question about whether an a piece of evidence is relevant or not, you're going to err on the side of safety and collect it. We, yes, we would try so to do that. You, just because <laughs> you collect it, an artifact does not mean that it has anything to do with the case. Correct. But if appropriate, you will send it off to the crime lab because they might be able to run tests on it and find out stuff that's proven. Yes. And some stuff may not even go to the that's right. Isn't it that the, uh, the lead detective that makes the call on what evidence needs to be tested and what doesn't? Yes. That'd be Detective Rush. Yes. Um, it didn't rain the uh, night before on May the 10th, if you can remember. Okay? I don't recall. When you walked down by the creek, did you see mud? Um, it was... Uh, or hard dirt. Or yes. Mud or yeah, stuff. wet because of the creek, mud? but yeah, well, there was mud on like dirt on his clothing. Yes. Um, and the, by the time you uh, arrived there, I, I noticed in your letter you met the responding officers. Yes. And by the time you arrived there, <coughs> the scene had been roped off with yellow tape. Yes, sir. When you were there, people were being kept out of that area. Yes. No. Did you happen to ask uh, what persons had actually walked down and gone down to the scene and made a list of people that had possibly contaminated the scene? Uh, the first officers on scene, the uniformed officers, will normally in, uh, keep what's called a crime scene log. And that's a list of people that arrive on the scene, what their function is, their name, their code number, and what their purpose is. And would it be the lead detective that would make uh, a termination, the determination of when the ambulance or when the body would be removed and taken to the board? No. Whose decision was that? The coroner. And was the coroner there while you, you had arrived? The coroner was there and not prior to my arrival um, because our investigations take some time and we have to process the scene. They don't always come out because they can be standing there for hours. The coroner will defer to the police investigators with, with respect to when to remove the body. Yes. Were you there when the body was actually removed? Um, I don't recall being there when he was physically removed, no. Do you remember uh, seeing Trey's back and taking good notes of his back? I wouldn't say I took great notice because, I say yes. Did you say yes. Of, did you happen to see that footprint on his back? He had what appeared to be noted as footprints. I, I didn't get like close enough that I could was, determine. Know. Yes. What about, uh, did you notice any other footprints around in the mud? Uh, did you note of that? No, I did not. Uh, you have a. Again, I didn't sure. document the scene in, in written form. Yes. You have a little uh, notepad you carry around with you? Yes. While you're walking around looking, do you make notes about what happens? Um, if I'm documenting the scene, yes. 
Did you make notes when you were documenting this scene? I w wasn't documenting the scene. So I was just taking, notes. I wasn't making notes. Okay. When you're interviewing uh, people, you do, you do make notes? Yes. And you have a tape recorder with you and you use that to tape record statements? Yes, if, if it's available, yes. Because yeah, you're trying to preserve evidence. Right. Um, I neglected to mention that uh, uh, Major Burbrink was there and Lieutenant Thompson were both there at the scene when you arrived. That's correct. And were they pretty much directing traffic or no. was, uh, Detective Roberts pretty much directing traffic? Uh, um, not Detective Roberts, Detective uh, Rush. When I arrived, Detective Rush wasn't there yet, so. Okay. Um, and at what point did he take over as far as uh, taking control of the investigation? As soon as he arrived. The first person that you interviewed was uh, Lonnie Skaggs? Yes. You interviewed Lonnie Skaggs at 2.49 um, p.m. Yes. And is it fair to say that um, if you saw someone <coughs> at a crime scene that you didn't recognize, the inclination would be to talk to that person to see if they knew anything or saw anything in Yes, sir. Um, and did you interview Dylan Rodriguez? I did. Uh, was Dylan Rodriguez with uh, Lonnie Ray Skaggs? No, sir. And I don't believe you noted a time. Oh, actually, uh, 3.30. You talked to him at 3.30. No, sir. He, um, oh, I'm sorry. He's, okay. He arrived home from work at 3.30 that what morning. Time, I'm sorry. I was trying to find out what time you talked to him. I'm, I didn't note the time that I talked to him. You when you did? Uh, it would have been within minutes of Mr. Skaggs. Okay. Uh, and then you didn't interview anybody else until Amanda Campbell came? Yeah, that's correct. And Detective Russ made the assignments on who to interview? Uh, it's kind of complicated because we had sergeants that arrived and other commanding officers, lieutenants, and um, sometimes they will ask you to do things as well. Um, so you, you listen to your, your commanding officer. When you approach a scene, I assume you try to have an open mind? Yes. But you also try to follow clues if clues are available? Yes. When you find yourself at a scene, anybody can be a suspect? Absolutely. So you're not going to rule out anybody until you can uh, properly rule them out if they weren't following the case? Yes. When you arrived there, you didn't have any particular suspects in mind? Uh, the entire city of Louisville was, could have been a suspect. I mean, we had no, no suspects at all. Detective Russ could have been a suspect. Uh, he could have been. <laughs> I, didn't, I don't. Okay. But he works at night and uh, usually sleeps during the day, so I don't, I'd have to verify his whereabouts. So, um, it's good practice to interview individuals alone, isn't it? Yes, it is. And the reason you do that is because you don't want another person trying to influence what the interviewee might say? Correct. You were able to interview Amanda Campbell by herself? Yes. She was uh, interviewed at 448? Yes. And you preserved that interview? Yes, sir. And the idea of tape recording is so that the exact words will be available at a later time. Right. If there's a question about that, you can always play the tape. That's correct. And it doesn't have any subjective impressions like a write-up might have. Right. Filters all that out. Mm -hmm. Amanda mentioned problems with the kids at Bridgewood. Yes. And she was concerned that the Bridgewood kids have been coming over. Object to hearsay, Your Honor? No, no. Come on.
Amanda that told you that Trey had been having problems with Bridgewood kids? She was the first to mention that, yes. And that uh, the boys had been coming over and jumping their kids and stealing stuff from them? Yes. She also told you that Trey had his cell phone stolen but got it back recently? Yes. Now, uh, you also talked with Galper? Yes, sir. And you began your conversation with him at 502? Yes, sir. During the time you were doing interviews, is it true that Detective Russ was also talking to people at the scene? Uh, I can't say what he was doing. Can you multitask? No, I can't. Not from inside, I can't. Okay. Uh, Mr. Galker also mentioned to you that there were a group of black kids from Bridgewood that had been jumping kids from the neighborhood. Yes. And uh, Amanda was present when he said that. Yes. And that was the same thing that Amanda had said. Correct. Uh, he said that they had taken Trey's phone but given it back. Yes, sir. He also introduced the name of a kid named Ray that was some sort of a contact. He apparently was a black kid in the, in the neighborhood that knew the Ridgewood kids. Yes, I think he was the kind of the, the middleman between. Go between. Yes. And he also said the problems had persisted for about three weeks. Yes, sir. And he uh, was complaining about the fact that the police uh, hadn't done anything about the problem. He said that the police... Objection, hearsay. Overruled. He said the police had been contacted. He was complaining about that pretty vigorously. Yes, he said all that they were doing was taking reports. Did he use the N-word? Yes, he did. Okay. And did you ever follow up to see if, in fact, there had been complaints made uh, from any people or families in the neighborhood to complain about any bridge with kids? No, everything I I gave it over to other the over. lead detectives. Right. Yeah. You said the Bridgewood kids came over to hang out with Ray. Oh, I'm sorry. When you say the question you just said, did I do any follow up to see no, if no, there were no, any no, other kids? You said you didn't know about follow up. I'm just I'm shifting okay. back to what Gabber said now. I'm just saying we did do some follow up to see who the kids were. Um, from Bridgewood that might have been involved with the kids. So you're, you're ahead of me. I okay. was saying, did you follow right. up to see if, it, in fact, people in had made reports? That area had actually made police reports about the interior. About no, the I did not do that. Um, and he said that the uh, kids came from the West End to Bridgewood, and that's where they would hang out with Ray. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you subsequently learned the name of the person known as Ray as uh, Rebontes Carter. Yes, sir. And Rebontes was friendly to the neighborhood boys. Yes. That's what Capper said. That's, I believe, what that's what he said. Yes. Right. So, were you going to pick up on this Bridgewood theme because you would, you didn't want to rule them out as suspects because they could possibly be involved in it? Of course. Because there was reported a violence in the neighborhood. At that point, they were the only ones that had been named as possible suspects, as so who might have been involved or um, who Trey had been in any sort of altercation with, and we had to start there. And you also interviewed, uh, after that, Donovan Hudson? Yes. And you interviewed him at 637? Uh, I have it listed as 537. 537. Yes, sir. And you also interviewed him at Liberty? Yes. Did he just happen to walk up to Liberty, or was he asked to come to the scene? Um, his father was there, and I believe we had him. He had been the one to notify Amanda that there was a body found down there. So he had already been in the area of the scene, to my knowledge, which is how she got the information. Um, reading, reading your summary of the statement, um, the first item of substance that you mentioned is that he said Trey and some of the friends had been having problems with kids at Bridgewood with yes. a kid named Antoine that goes by the name of Antoine. That's correct. And did he volunteer that on his own or did you say do you have any idea or did you suggest to him something about the Bridgewood kids? I'm interested in finding out how that came out. Okay. Do you mind if I take a look at the transcript Please yourself? Please do. Okay. Uh, 
looks like uh, looks like I was the one that initiated that. And the reason you initiated it was because that had come up in other interviews. That's correct. And you wanted to check out to see if, in fact, there was consistent information. Yes. From other people. And he actually gave you more information and gave you a name of a person named Tuan. Yes. W A N. Mm hmm. And he, just, he gave a physical description? And he talked about a kid named Ray, uh, Ray Von Dennis Carter. He's the one that gave me his name. Um, and he gave, said he believed that they were from 10th Street, somewhere downtown mm -hmm. on 10th Street. Um, um, and then he gave have a you description, yes. Oh, go ahead. Uh, and, gave, and then gave a, a description of uh, Antoine. And then Joey Ballard uh, came to the scene? Yes. <laughs> and he was asked about when the last time he saw Trey, et cetera. And then he was asked about this boy named Tuan. You have a page number of the transcript that you're referring Mystery to? It might help. Summary. Okay. Oh, it's my letter? Summary, yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, what was the question? Okay, he, um, and I guess what I'm going to ask you is, did you yourself bring up the question of the Bridgewood kids, or did Joey Ballard start up with that and say, oh, I think I know who did it, it's the Bridgewood kids? Again, I'd have to look through the transcript itself to be specific. Yeah, could you do that, please? Sure. Do you, is there anything of reference you want me to go directly to, or do you want me to start Just from the beginning? Just how that started. Okay. Do you have a page number that you no, want me to I'm reference? Okay, okay. Now. Okay, I'd, I had made reference. Okay, was there anything that happened or that? Four pages of report. All right, on the last page of your letter of right. Yeah, I was giving you the discovery. Antoine Duncan, uh, Amaria Howard, and Jordan Hayes. Right. Well, the reason that the letters are used, I guess, instead of naming, is because of you. <coughs> okay. And you're trying to protect. I don't even know. Did you wipe out that? No. Somebody else must have wiped yeah. that out because they're juveniles. Okay, and they were actually you got court orders and had them brought to the police headquarters. Yes. And they were questioned about all this. Yes. Other than the people that you talked to uh, about the Bridgewood kids, did other people mention Bridgewood? Those were the only interviews that I did. But every person that you interviewed at the scene mentioned the Bridgewood kids? Um, with the, the exception, exception of the first two. Lonnie Ray, yeah, and Mike Dunn. Did Amanda's interview end at 5.02? Um, yes, yeah. I believe that's what I testified to. Yes, sir. Okay, and Gapper was from 5.02, and I have uh, 5.16. Does that sound right? Generally, yeah. I, d I don't think I had a time listed on the transcript. Were you paying attention to Gapper at the scene? At the scene, no, because he was uh, over in the parking lot behind the school, and I was on the other side of the building. Do you know if Gowker asked to see Trey's body? 
He asked if we could uh, show him a picture. He was interested in seeing a picture of to Trey's see if, body. if he could identify whether or not it was Trey. He didn't ask to go down there and see the body. I just recall him saying, "Can we?" I don't object to hearsay. Come on. I just have one last question, and um, the court orders uh, with respect to the Bridgewood kids, yes. those were sealed orders, weren't they? I believe so. Thank you. Redirect. Thank you, Your Honor. Very briefly. Um, I just want to clarify, um, it, Mr. Schuler was asking you about, I think his statement was, Everybody mentioned the Bridgewood kids, but then we had to we had to kind of back it up a little bit because um, Lonnie Skaggs did or did not mention the Bridgewood kids. He did not. And Dylan Rodriguez did or did not. Did not. And I believe that you testified, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but as for, as it relates to Donovan Hudson and Joey Ballard, who brought the trouble with the kids up, you or them? I did. Okay. So is it correct to say the only people who on their own mentioned the trouble with the kids are Josh Gowker, Amanda Campbell, and Josh Young. That's correct. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Let, let me just correct you on that. Uh, but first of all, let me, let me just ask you about Lonnie Skaggs was an adult. Yes. He didn't live on Ben Drive. He was on Kramer's. And Dylan Rodriguez was an adult, and he didn't live on Ben Drive. Correct. Now, Joshua Young brought up Bridgewood in response to your question. Correct. If Yes. You asked him about Bridgewood. Yes. He said he didn't think it was a big deal. 
I don't remember him saying that he didn't think it was a big deal. I just remember that, I mean, I can look directly what he said, but I don't, I don't recall him saying it wasn't a big deal. I guess the words will, will speak for themselves. Okay. During his interview, you could, you could just find those, but he was, okay. yeah, they will speak for themselves. Okay. But can you just, uh, and I know the jury's already heard that, but maybe we need to highlight it, since just to clarify how that was brought up. The bottom of page four of the transcript. Okay. Uh, but okay. Um, anybody he's particularly been in arguments with, or I mean, Josh says, uh, I mean, there's been problems at their bus stop, like you probably heard from everybody you've interviewed. Yeah, yeah. Josh says, with, I ask, have you been to a par Have you been a party to any of that? Any trouble going on? Uh, I don't go to that. I don't go to that school. Oh, that's right. Okay. So I don't get off or get on this bus there. <laughs> I asked, do you know any of the kids from the apartments over there after after school that he says very few of them I know. I say, okay, um, has he said any, anybody's name that he's been beefing with? Uh, Young, he really didn't have any problems. Maroney, okay. Young, except the bus stop. Maroney, okay. And has he mentioned anybody by name from the bus stop? Young, uh-uh. Maroney, okay. And has he indicated, you know, who these kids are, who they're friends with, or what they're doing at the bus stop? Young. They tried to take his phone. Maroney, okay. Young. And gave it back. That was a couple of weeks ago. Maroney, okay. Did he say, is he saying whose friends they are or who they're hanging out with? Young. He doesn't know them. I know. I know. Maroney, okay. Young. Probably Ray. You've probably already heard that name from everybody, too. Maroney, yeah, okay. Young. But Ray was close with him like we all were. Maroney, so Ray's a good guy? Young, yeah. Maroney, in your all's opinion, okay. And that, is that Ray Carter? Young, I don't know his last name. Maroney, okay. Young, I only met him a couple times. Maroney, okay, so there's no problems with Ray to your knowledge. Young, okay. Or I say, okay. Um, and then I say, uh, <coughs> have you heard any rumors or anybody talking out here that haven't, that has theories about what happened? Or Young, nobody knows anything. And I go on to say, okay, all right, well, uh, I'm talking to all the other guys, too, and I told your dad and Amanda there's going to be rumors flying around about this, and some of them will, true, will be true and some of them won't, and uh, that's our job to determine which ones are true and which ones are not, but that we need to know all of them. So if you hear anything, of course, tell your dad, tell Amanda, and have them call us. We'll look into it. Um, we don't know a whole lot right now because... These are the early steps that we take in any investigation, but since you were, you know, lived with him and were so close to him, obviously you're a key person that we want to talk with, talk to. Uh, did you, do you know if, have you been home and have you, do you know his cell, if his cell phone's at home or young? If, if that's not, that doesn't involve the bridge, we can probably catch right. Okay. Yeah, the timing is really important. Okay. And I want to make sure the jury knows the timing. Joey and Donovan were interviewed after Amanda. Yes. Yes. And prior to Young. Prior to Young, yes. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Is it, were you correct when you testified that in fact the defendant had not said, I don't think that's a big deal with the kids? Yes, that was correct. Okay. That's all. Any questions from the jury of Detective Maroney? Okay, we have at least one. Anybody else? If... Here's your chance. Okay, if you have a question, write it down. Let me know with a show of the hand. The deputy will bring it up to me. I will look at it, decide whether we can ask it. Can I have the attorneys up here, please?
two questions from uh, the jury that I can ask. I'll read them to you, and then if you'll let the jury have your answer. Which adult was present for Josh Young's interview? Uh, neither parent was present for his interview. He was brought to me by his father. Joey Ballard stated the Bridgewood kids had hit his friend Josh. Which Josh was this? I believe it was Josh Cull. Okay. Any other questions from the jury? May we release this witness? Yes. Detective, thank you very much. You're free to go. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our break for the day today a little bit early. Tonight, remember your admonition. Uh, this case is receiving extensive publicity. Do not watch any show, news program that you think might have coverage, whether it's radio, television. I'm, I'm reluctant to tell you not to watch any news, but uh, because this will certainly be on the local uh, and some of the national news media outlets, it's probably the best thing to do. How's the note? book working for you all and taking notes. Is that working okay? Is it comfortable? Okay. Yes, sir. Sometimes when the defense lawyer walks up in front of you, you can't hardly hear him. Like he's walking up close to the person on the... Any, okay. And that's because he's off a microphone? I so, get, I mean, so thank you. Walking, I, sometimes okay. he goes in and out. You can't I, will, I will school him about the importance of keeping his voice up once you all leave. Uh, I'm serious. I mean, I know. Okay. That's very important. You need to hear his questions. Right. Okay. All right. Leave your notepads here. Uh, we're going to resume tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. See you back then. All rise for the departing jury. Jury's out of the courtroom. Anything we need to take up before we recess for the evening? Not that I can think of, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Shuler, you have been appropriately schooled on the importance of keeping your voice up. I thought I was keeping it up. But. Well, at least one juror can't hear you well enough, so that's one too many. All right. We'll see you all tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Can I see uh, defense counsel up here just a minute? Did you tell the jury you're on the call? Did I tell the jury what? Yeah, to be here at 9 o'clock? I, I know you told us. I just can't remember if you told the jury. <laughs> okay. this thing. This is the most expensive app available on the uh, App Store website. $799. Look how. <laughs>